The views and opinions expressed by the guests of the Inspira podcast do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of any agency of the United States government or any organization, public or private. Welcome to the Inspira podcast, hosted by your girl, me, Erica Mueller Chen. I'm an international development specialist with over a decade of experience leveraging the amazing power of sport to promote peace and positive social impact. My career has allowed me to live in Europe, Southern Africa, and Latin America. In 2022, I accepted an offer for my dream job in sports diplomacy. And I also became an employee family member to a U.S. diplomat, a.k.a. an EFM. This podcast is all about inspiration and career advice. Each episode, I'll interview an inspirational global changemaker working in sport for development, social impact, or the diplomatic service. This series is perfect if you have interest in breaking into one of these sectors or you've already landed that dream role and are keen to learn from thought leaders. Enjoy today's episode and stay inspired. I think that these organizations that that do not identify because they don't know SDP can learn so much from the field. The field is so developed that there is a lot of knowledge out there that could be super helpful for them. But at the same time, the SDP field could learn from these initiatives that that start without any previous knowledge. They can add something to the table to see, huh, look at this. Maybe we should look more into this simple methodology. What if we can pilot initiatives in this way? It's important, obviously, that I do something for Sicily, but at the same time, I hope that Sicily can do something for everyone else. Welcome, friends. Today's special guest is Alessio Norito. Alessio brings an outstanding academic background and knowledge of sport for development. Originally from Italy, Alessio earned his degree in international business with Chinese from the University of Westminster, which included one year in Shanghai as part of his studies. He went on to earn his master's in sport policy management and international development with distinction from the University of Edinburgh. Now he is pursuing his PhD at Loughborough University. Alessio's research focuses on the role of football in improving the lives of refugees in the central Mediterranean area. Other than being a doctoral researcher, where I'm sure he has plenty of free time, Alessio currently serves as the managing editor for the Journal of Sport for Development. Alessio, since the name of this podcast is Inspira, I like to start each episode recognizing why our guest, you, inspires me. And I'm excited to share that you and I had the privilege of working together on the Journal of Sport for Development, just briefly. And I must say, it was really fun. Uh, You inspire me because of how organized you are, super collaborative and supportive. I even, I haven't told you this, I even started taking some of the things that you would put in your emails, greetings and closing well wishes And I started using them for myself because they just made me feel so good the way that you write and communicate. I know you may be early in your career, and I'm excited to learn more about how you got to where you are now, as well as any tips you have for others, especially folks in Italy or young people considering a career in sport for development research. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much, Erica. What what a great welcome! I'm, I mean, it, it's great to hear that my uh, uh, greetings are good as well. You know, sometimes when uh, English is not your first language, you feel like, am I saying the right thing or not? So it's good. It's good that they, they work. <laughs> Thank you so much. Of course, and I can only imagine the thoughts you have in your mind because you're competent in at least three languages, including Mandarin. So uh, yes, your English to me is absolutely incredible. I would love to start with a little bit more about your background and experiences in Italy, especially growing up. Can you tell me a little bit more about how your upbringing in Italy influenced your personal and professional interests? 
I could tell you many anecdotes. The first time I, I left Italy, uh, and by Italy, I want to say Sicily, Palermo, the city where I'm from. I moved into a small Scottish village or town called uh, Lonehead uh, near Edinburgh. So 15 minutes uh, from, uh, from Edinburgh. And I was 15 at the time. I was a high school student. I must say that I was not the most brilliant student until then, because I, I, I wasn't pr pretty motivated that, uh, at school. My interest was mostly in, in sport and football. Sport and football were not really that valued uh, uh, academically and uh, symbolically, culturally. Uh, there was probably a stigma against uh, football and uh, e-sport in, uh, in general, to an extent that one of my high school teachers once said that uh, uh, football should not be uh, in a classroom, looking back at it now, I feel, wow, there's you know, so many classrooms with uh, football and sport in it that really made me think, yeah, the context was, was very, very different. And uh, I understand where she's coming from, but at the same time, I, I had my different beliefs. So but besides this, it is a small parenthesis. I went to Scotland and then all of a sudden my uh, mentality changed. I, I started to get more interested into learning English and uh, studying more. I was exposed to uh, to do more subjects than what I was doing in Italy. In Italy, I was doing Latin and ancient Greek, uh, while in uh, uh, Scotland, I was more in uh, studying business management or engineering crafts and uh, uh, physical education, which for the first uh, time. So it, it opened a new world, and I decided that I want to explore more of that new world because I knew already what uh, my what Sicily what Palermo was and I, I I love the place where I come from but at the same time I do understand that probably the best opportunities for me and for my interests are are not there that's why I I tie my research to the the, the my place of origin because it's the best way to give back and you know my family is all there I I often joke that my uh, parent uh, my, my relative that's uh, the, the most distant from Palermo lives on Galileo Road, which is actually north of Palermo. Uh, but besides that, is very it, it, I, I have that attachment to 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 my to to, to the place I'm from, and uh, because there's there's not probably there isn't much research on on Sicily, even if there's a lot of things going on there. And I I hope that with this uh, PhD that I'm doing now, I can shed some light into the practices that can help not only Sicily, but you know, understand this whole world of difference that there are in, uh, in SDP uh, as a sector and as a movement. So I, I hope I didn't go too much off track with the question, but uh, yeah, basically, uh, since then it has been, since Scotland, it has been a different uh, uh, experience time by time by time and I, I i would say i changed a lot in in my career before finding what i really wanted to do and all these have been very uh, important experiences from london my my first experience in a university as you said i was studying international business with chinese with mandarin so it was it's completely unrelated probably to what i'm doing right now but it was it, it was all rooted in the fact that I wanted to to discover something new after I've discovered the, this new world in uh, in the UK, and I thought this, I will never have the chance to learn Chinese by myself or have a uh, Mandarin by myself. Or you know, the university was that uh, place where I could really uh, deepen my my interest, and it, so it has been because I had the opportunity to go to Shanghai to to uh, study uh, Mandarin and work there. And uh, uh, I mean, it, it was it was great. Then my interest in change changed a little bit. I went back to Edinburgh uh, to have this uh, uh, wonderful master that focused on policy management and international development in the sports sector, which is the best introduction and uh, uh, introduction and uh, discovery that someone who's interested in sport can uh, can do. And I had uh, amazing uh, amazing teachers there that have really inspired this interest in me and uh, that's that when the, the the phd idea started but then you know you are at a crossroad and you say okay i do the phd or i start and go to work because the 
it was that offer from from China that was still no hanging there, <laughs> and so I said. I'll go into work for now because maybe I can work better on the ideas that I have on the PhD. Meanwhile, and I mean, I I hope the PhD opportunity will be there in the future. Or well, maybe this work opportunity. When we're talking about careers, you know, sometimes you receive an offer and you you have to accept within like five days, and that can change your 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 plans. But yeah, that's basically after a bit of work in the e-commerce industry, food sector, learning about the different type of Italian food that can get imported into China and what is impossible to import <laughs> when you get. So you learned it all. Yes, yes, it was it was a new learning process. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, after that, though, I had also a, a quick, um, a very brief, not very brief, it was still one year experience in uh, uh, Italy, in Northern Italy. Uh, it was the first time coming back since a long time. Uh, and again, I had a, an amazing experience. Uh, it's just that the, 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 my interests were uh, in, in sport. I was working in a chocolate company, so like... Uh, my, I could say my boss was Willy Wonka and I was a Oompa Loompa. You know? so <laughs> it was amazing. I mean, you get the chocolate every day. But uh, besides that, uh, it was it. it I I was also like having a PhD project in my in my bag. And once the opportunity uh, was presented to me at Loughborough University, I didn't think uh, twice, and I, I just decided that this. No, it's my path and I want to pursue this, this passion. So it sounds like you've been deeply shaped by the three countries you've spent a lot of time in, Italy, yes. the UK, and China. And yeah. I, um, you said so much there. I had all of these <laughs> follow-up thoughts. Um, one was about how you mentioned sport maybe wasn't as legitimate to some professors and I feel like that's something that the world and society are still grappling with today and then the other thing I was thinking when you talked about your undergraduate experience studying Chinese I studied ethnic studies at Brown which didn't relate to sport but I tried to weave sport into everything that I could but I was really happy that I studied something other than sport in that context because it gave me a different frame of thinking and a different network of people so that if sport was still there for me later in terms of an interest I had I could still study it somewhere else or work in it somewhere else so I really support that direction of studying something unrelated to sport and then coming back to it because as you said the PhD will still be there and if you're still interested that means you're really gonna do it and it makes sense at that time so um yeah that that was a, a wonderful backdrop of just walking us through how you got to this moment it was a journey I would say that uh led me into the, the finally doing the PhD but as you said I really agree with the uh, the, the the need of uh, going from a wider umbrella and deepening into sport where I, I you said something that I did for most of my undergrad that every assignment that I could I would throw football in there just to see like uh, if you know, uh, that, that to, to show in the future that my interests are clearly that. I mean, uh, at the time when I was doing my undergrad, it was a big uh, investment coming from uh, China into this own football league. And uh, I thought, uh, well, no, wouldn't be bad to be involved in football in, uh, in China in the, in the future, especially when you are in, with the business mentality, you feel that that's going to be a very good opportunity. And then obviously you get attached to uh, culture and living there and this and that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to agree with what, <laughs> what you said. Probably I said. <laughs> When did you first learn about or experience sport as a vehicle for social change and development? Uh, in Edinburgh, I think that the it, it was probably something that I always believed in since uh, since I was very young, and uh, it, it's probably uh, the stories of footballers that really have uh, shaped my my thinking of what what uh, sport can do. You no, know, from very early age, you think of uh, uh, 
the, the concept is quite basic of someone who's dreaming of being a footballer and then it really becomes a footballer and uh, it comes with success and with the, the image that the footballer builds. A very basic thought. But then I, as you grow up, you understand there is more deep into that. And for one that doesn't make it, uh, that does make it, there are a million that don't. And so you start to think of more critically about that concept that you have at the start. And when I was in Edinburgh, I think I had my, my, uh, uh, say, ha -ha light bulb, moment. aha yes. moment. I, I learned the haha moment uh, quite uh, recently, so I wanted to use it at some point. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's that like when I I started discussing, for example, the importance of uh, diplomacy in uh, in sport for development was uh, one one interesting. Uh, the aspect i would say that all the lectures on policy for example on sport policy uh, on international development itself it, it, it was something that i started discovering academically and then uh, we would have uh, like the i i would relate it to what was happening in uh, in uh, sicily uh, uh, because the, the project started really to the initial spark started at the masters and i started to relate it to what was going on in sicily and i was being like, okay, there is a, a di there is similarities and a different, and that's how when I when I really got interested in in sport for development, I would say. I know several people who have received their masters at Edinburgh, and it's extremely oh. impressive, and it's quite unique. I feel compared to other masters in sport related topics, I would imagine that your previous experience in Scotland influenced you a little bit to choosing that program. Were there any other factors that you considered when deciding on that program specifically? Yes, so I have to tell you that Edinburgh is probably still now my absolute favorite city in the world. It's, you know, when, when, when I have, uh, I have uh, the first time that I opened my eyes to the world, it was Edinburgh. So, you know, that's not better. I don't think that I could have a different influence in my life than the city of Edinburgh. And so that was the, the main, the main uh, uh, objective. The, the, the Uni of Edinburgh is very inside the, the city. And so it is part of the city itself. So when you visit the city, you feel of it as being a, a, an institution that uh, uh, makes you maybe dreamy, dreamy about it. You know, something that like I said, wow, it'd be, be good. It'd be really nice if one day I could, could go there. So when the opportunity opened up, I felt like it was a, a dream coming true. For, for me, and that influenced, uh, influenced me a lot. It was really an amazing, an amazing year. And uh, yeah, that, that there was a lot of influence in my growing up phase, I would say, to that. Quick break here to highlight what I consider to be a fabulous resource that I've created for any listeners out there interested in learning more about the sport for development and peace sector. You've come to the right place. In addition to Inspira podcast episodes that you can listen to, I've created a written resource that you can read, which currently has over 90 items I've curated from my own experience and vetted with other experts in the field. These include databases to find award-winning organizations, links to reports, books, and research, as well as recommended newsletters and recorded webinars, all Sport for Dev related. I encourage you to have a look. You can find this resource by visiting my link tree listed in each episode's show notes, then clicking Erica's Global Resource Hub. That's right, Erica's Global Resource Hub. If you like what you read and what you hear, I'd love it if you could give Inspira a five-star review on your chosen podcast platform and write a kind review. That would be so energizing for me and it would help Inspira reach more ears. Thanks and back to the show. You are pursuing your PhD which is incredible. Tell me more about how you got to that decision and how the experience has been so far. Okay, so the, the, the PhD is 
one very uh, one of the very long achievements of my life i have to say the the idea uh, sparked first from uh, lampedusa and from one assignment that i actually did in edinburgh uh, where we had to do to write an advice paper for a government or for a local government on how to use sport to handle a particular situation in that in, in that local government. And I decided to write my assignment on Lampedusa because uh, Lampedusa is this island that is still part of Sicily and is the southernmost part of Italy and one where many uh, refugees that cross the Mediterranean by boat are rescued and then temporarily hosted to then go uh, and, and continue their, their journey in, uh, in Europe. Uh, at the time, 2017, the refugee crisis was still a, 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 um, an important uh, issue in uh, Europe. And uh, I say this provocatively because it is still an important issue. It doesn't matter that the numbers have gone down. There's still this very dangerous route that people undertake. There was the system being built into place of this hotspot approach where uh, the, the refugee center of Lampedusa uh, was in poor conditions, often over, uh, over capacity. And I, want, I, I thought that their sport, uh, sport could be of, uh, of help into addressing the, the, the situation. And uh, in, in a way that uh, creating a refugee camp within an island that is already remote itself, it's a, it's a very strange procedure, if I have to use the most simple word, that is, is creating a, a, a prison on a remote island, it's, it's not really the, the, the best and uh, something that I could actually explore today in, uh, in my PhD is that uh, sport can have a role in interacting people among each other within the refugee population, but also with the local population has been always very open to welcome uh, refugees in, in Lampedusa. And then I started working on a project to translate this into my PhD, because I thought that this was really what represented my interest the most, and at the same time, a real problem that's happening in the real world that I would like to uh, solve. I love connecting this to what you were speaking about at the beginning of our conversation, how you are pursuing research topics that are close to your heart and close to the location that you grew up in. I think that's incredibly special. And as you mentioned earlier, a way that you hope to contribute to Italy and to give back. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's very important that to relate, to motivate my myself when, because PhD is not, uh, you have some days where like you, you feel exhausted, but when there is that motivating factor, it really pushes you uh, forward. Nice. And I'll mention similarly to my views on Edinburgh that the University of Loughborough also has an excellent reputation and excellent scholars in the field of sport and sport for development and peace. And you had also mentioned to me before this conversation that Loughborough recently received the UNESCO chair on sport, physical activity and education for development. So I would imagine that that placement at Loughborough has hopefully supported you and others by uh, connecting that topic with more scholars at the university. Yes, yes. I, I, I think that uh, this is an amazing achievement for Loughborough. And I have to say that I, I, I really like the, the, the environment here. The university is very uh, sport-centered and any, any, any uh, aspect of, uh, of sports from performance to health related to sociology but also the business side and I have to say that uh, I, I do share my working space with uh, many other PhD students the, the amount of things that are happening uh, I, don't be, I call it behind the scenes are amazing mm -hmm. and uh, the, the, the type of discussions that you can have the, the, when you can create this environment where you can have like incredibly important discussions it's it's it's, it's like 
I don't even know if the right word exists to describe this. Like it's extremely stimulating, but at the same time, extremely exciting and makes you feel that like you're living in sport 24 seven in the most positive and, uh, and uh, uh, intellectually stimulating way. But at the same time, knowing that there's someone working to make change and it's it's very, very important. So. Yeah, I, I, I do feel that the environment here after is something that uh, I, in Palermo I could only drink for. If uh, we go back and I tell you that the, the, uh, uh, the sport should never be inside a classroom, as my high school teacher said, uh, I don't think that he or she be happy. That's what I'm <laughs> And I understand, Alessio, that you've had at least two major research topics. One we've touched on a little bit already in terms of forced migrants in Sicily and the central Mediterranean route. And then the other that you shared with me is related, uh, but a little bit different in terms of aspirations of refugees and forced migrants in football. Is there anything you can share with us about your interest in that topic, the importance of that topic, and any of your findings so far? Yes, so I would say that they are uh, interrelated. So I often think of it as one topic, but I tell you why I think of it as one topic, because it's like the underlying base for which people then decide to go into a sport for development program or decide not to go. So they, they have an interest, a very important interest in football uh, that is their skill, their dream and their future. I would say that this is the, if I can share some uh, initial findings, I would say that these are the three words that I would use to describe uh, the, the aspiration of, uh, of forced migrants in Sicily. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's important to understand what the aspirations are because if when we want to then uh, uh, do an initiative or a program that is uh, uh, sport for development oriented, we need to think if we're bringing too much leisure into that, then uh, participants would not be interested in that leisure. Uh, they, are, they are people that are under pressure of paying bills, maybe sometimes supporting the families that are, uh, that are back, that couldn't make the journey. And therefore they are under pressure of earning uh, an income to, of, of bettering the livelihoods to then help others and help themselves. So if they see in football a way to find a job, they will not be happy that you see in football a way to provide leisure. Uh, therefore, there needs to be an alignment in what are the aspirations and what are the, is then offered by the program. And I think that is very important that this alignment comes from the participants' own experiences and uh, uh, necessities, which I think is key term is a sport that works for the participants. It's not the, the, the sport program that then is made to shape uh, the participants in a certain way through a certain philosophy. So I strongly believe in, in a medium between the, the, the interests of the population and at the same time, making sure that sport can provide something that will help their positive resettlement and their livelihoods. Because again, it goes back to the discussion, not everyone, unfortunately, will, will become a footballer. Football is a closed system. Uh, I always make the example that whenever the Italian league plays, no matter uh, how good you are, they're gonna, the, 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 there's always going to be only 220 players that start the game every single, uh, every single football day. So it, it is a closed system. It, it's not that, oh, wow, there are so many new good footballers. Let's play 13 against 13. No, that doesn't happen. It's always 11 against 11. So it, within this closed system, uh, it is important to make uh, refugees understand that it's a highly unlikely because there are, they are disruptions in their lives that have stopped their training and their development as footballers. And uh, uh, some maybe don't have the, the, the same training in the first place as someone who started a football academy in the UK at five year old or in Italy at six year old. I, I don't know when it actually starts, but there, there is a, a, a clear disadvantage. But at the same time, their interest is football. So it's important that you understand this interest to, to then tailor your program. 
And without going too much into detail, how do you study that topic? Okay, I I, I will do it as as as, uh, as less academic as possible because. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being in anybody else. <laughs> I have visited these programs over periods of uh, eight months, I would say, mostly, obviously uh, interrupting from time to time, but I've been in refugee centers where the programs take place. I've seen the different programs, so uh, not only one, uh, uh, but different with different capacity, different uh, uh, strategies, different locations, which you know, context and location are also important within Sicily itself. Palermo has almost 1 million inhabitants, while uh, the city of uh, Idone, for example, where another program is, has only 3,000, and that obviously affects the, 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 the procedure. So I would go, I would do uh, interviews with the participants, and the one one thing that I changed uh, the, from my first approach is that I would uh, uh, go to participants first, so to refugees first through uh, through friends of the refugees or through local journalists that know the story very well, people who they trust a lot, really, to then ask them what they think is the, 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 the role of football in their lives. And then if they would point out to me of a program or of a, a specific initiative that they have, they would I would then try and get access to that initiative. Because sometimes I, it's different, I think, that what you see sometimes that you start from the organization at the top and then you are kind of funneled into the participant from that organization. And what I've seen is that my discussion then relates back to the organization often, while I want to see more of a totality of it, a holistic view, to then see what the SDP, what the organization, how the organization uh, interacts with the centrality of the participant. So yeah, I I hope I, I did, I wasn't too technical, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how interesting. And I love uh, personally the opportunity to do site visits and interact with participants, with coaches, with leaders to get that picture. And I also really appreciate what you said about aiming to view and understand the totality of just what the organization achieves. That's quite an important recognition that you have in your research. Thank you. Thank you. You've mentioned a little bit uh, the research gap in Italy for sport for development and peace. Tell me a little bit more or teach me a little bit more, if you might, about the practice of sport for development and peace in Italy, what that looks like on a practical level. How many organizations are aware of that concept, are aiming to promote the development of young people through the vehicle of sport? I'm really curious. Yeah, it's uh, so. It's an interesting question that I think I cannot under uh, I cannot uh, uh, answer in full, uh, but I can give you my my perception of growing up without that 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 concept uh, because it's uh, I would say that organizations do exist and they do what is the what is the philosophy of SDP so uh, sport for development to develop. Uh, you know, so it, it is, it is, it is there, but maybe it's not understood as SDP. I think that uh, uh, SDP has been for some time a very uh, anglophone term, and uh, for that, uh, it, it kind of shapes the practices in 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 an anglophone way. But at the same time, in Italy, we do have a, a non spoken, I would say, SDP. That then you see these initiatives, and they really fit under this category. Uh, and without categorizing too much, I can give you an example. For example, of the an example for example <laughs> of the less uh, uh, formal SDP initiative that I've ever seen. Uh, I was um, uh, with, a, with a participant and uh, he pointed out to me that he was training at a park with a group of uh, people, Italian, non-Italian, refugees, non-refugees, that they were training in the park and playing football. And there was this coach who was just 
no, guiding the, the, the training session. So I went there and observed at the park. I, I uh, spoke to the coach to, to, to like see if you know, I wanted to talk, to see a little bit how it was. And it's a very simple initiative. You, you play obviously 11 against 11, but there are more than 11, uh, than 22 people on the, um, in the park. So as they went substituting people, you would then have one-on-one -on -one sessions with them and speaking to them, hey, how are you? Like, what's going on with your life? Uh, and then it would give like personal suggestions on where to go, where to go next or like what they could do. And all this while, well, playing football really like from from you know a five minute discussion it's almost like a speed dating i would say where you like you know you have that five minutes and you 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 talk and you can have that like that two three sentence of advice from a, a, a reputable source and that could that helps a lot and so when i was pointed out to the participant about this it was funny because uh, this uh, organization didn't really have a name. Like, it's not, maybe it's not even an organization. I, I, if I have to deconstruct all of it, it's probably not even an organization. It's an initiative that happens quite frequently and that, that works without funding, but works with a fundamental methodology that is in place and, and that's, that's good, helps. Uh, uh, on from the eyes of the participants because it was pointed out by uh, they pointed out this initiative to me so that that felt really you know interesting very interesting to see something work in this way because the the idea that you have from sdps from times from the academic perspective is of a super organization obviously that uses a, a sport in a, a highly uh, calculated way to and achieve they have a theory of change and they have an m e plan it's exactly. like a business model for development exactly exactly it's really a business model but then like you see that maybe some some maybe obviously you achieve like when you have this amount of resources you achieve amount a, a huge amount of uh, of uh, objectives as well but then you acknowledge also that there are some things that maybe get caught up of the radar because if I didn't talk to the participant, hey, if we, do, we didn't point out to me this, we would have never uh, known about it because there's not a database that uh, has that. There's not a name for the, that initiative. So <laughs> it, it, it was quite interesting to understand that these differences of obviously like falling under the category of SDP is very... Uh, it, it's very uh, Anglo-centric from my 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 reading uh, and and my experience. Uh, and sometimes, like you read the definition to an organization, and they tell, "Oh yeah, yeah that that's us." And then, like you say, "Yeah, but you, you didn't know that before, right?" Like, so yeah, and and that obviously starts a conversation, and and it's very useful. I think both ways. I think that these organizations that, that do not identify because they don't know SDP can learn so much from the field. The field is so developed that there is a lot of knowledge out there that could be super helpful for them. But at the same time, the SDP field could learn from these initiatives that, that start without any previous knowledge. They can add something to the table to see, huh, look at this. Maybe we should look more into this simple methodology. What if we can pilot initiatives in this way? Or th there are many different ideas that, that the, the sector can tap in, in, in untapped uh, lands. So somewhere that like SDP maybe is not adopted, but has a lot that aligns to that concept. And I think that this can be like the, 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 the biggest contribution, I hope, for the, the, the sector. You know, it, it's important, obviously, that I that I do something for Sicily, but at the same time, I hope that Sicily can do something for some everyone else. You know, like it's not uh, uh, I, I care uh, Sicily uh, this and that. Uh, no, I, I feel that it needs to be uh, then a constant dialogue between the different contexts, and then create that knowledge that can really help the sector grow. I hope I didn't go too much off track with the question, right? That was one of my favorite things that you've said. Oh, I you. Yeah, all good, all good. <laughs> I I couldn't agree more about 
the conclusion you made from those insights in identifying the two-way learning avenue between the sector and practice. And of course, there's research as well, but really that interaction between the sector and what's actually happening in communities. And it just goes to show, and hopefully it's encouraging to some listeners or some people in different countries that sport doesn't have to be so formal and sport for development doesn't have to be designed by a researcher in order to be positive. Of course, hopefully those researchers uh, or that research intent and the intentionality to promote positive developmental outcomes should help, but it's not a prerequisite to making a positive social change. So I yes. love your answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think that I, you, you just uh, gave me a little uh, uh, addition that I would like to say. It's important to also, I think, as a researcher, I, I mean, as a training researcher, I would say, uh, is I think it, it, I feel it's also important for the field to report negative results. Yes, in my opinion, I feel that sometimes mm. some we we tend to report the positives because obviously we we are strong believers in the value that sport has. I think that everybody who, who's listening to us right now has that uh, uh, that that belief. But at the same time, when you report negative results you also pave a way of what needs to be done better. And that obviously helps with growth. And that's why like, I, I feel that sometimes going into this uh, untapped uh, SDP can help us understand uh, if there are any negatives and if there are any positives. It's, it's just about the, the added experiences, I would say that uh, this gives to the field. Thanks, Alessio, for that unsolicited opportunity that you're giving me to plug a previous Inspira podcast episode where the topic of failure in sport for development and the importance of failure and transparency within measurement and public communications is explored. So please check out Inspira episode seven with Matt Stevenson Dodd. And I'll also put an article Matt authored back in 2018 in The Guardian into the show notes titled my charity is better for being open about failure so i want to ask you a little bit about the journal of sport for development how has your experience been as managing editor mm -hmm. is there anything that you've learned from that role and are there any ways that that opportunity has contributed to your work as a doctoral researcher Yes, I learned an immense amount of things from the role. And I would like to say that uh, if uh, there is a PhD student who wants to do this, it's it's like, <laughs> it's really like a, an invaluable opportunity. I feel that uh, you enter in the, in the academic world not knowing what a journal is, what a process a journalist, what 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 it goes through, and sometimes like you you can see the different uh, discussions on different social medias on like uh, the reviewer one, uh, reviewer two, and uh, this and that. There, there, there's, there there is sometimes some some misconceptions that when you don't have that uh, that knowledge about publishing a paper or like uh, submitting a paper can really throw you off and not knowing what, what it is. I, I, I didn't know when I started and what, uh, how a journal was and what it was. So it, it was fundamental for me to learn again. I think the biggest takeaway that I want to, to, to say here is that if you're a PhD student and you're finding yourself in the opportunity to do work in a journal, uh, especially as a managing editor, where you see the everything of a journal, do it, especially at the start of your PhD journey is going to help you a lot. And when you start maybe submitting a paper, uh, you'll feel more confident, you'll know more. And when uh, a, a reviewer comes back, you do understand how reviews work. Uh, it's very, very helpful for an academic, I would say. From a practitioner as well, I think that the Journal of Sport for Development uh, are now going into not my experience, but uh, the, the fact that it is open access and that everybody can uh, gather that knowledge, it, it's extremely important. 
as Alessio and I know, I was the managing editor previously. <laughs> I was not a PhD student and don't plan to be. So it's not a prerequisite, but I do feel that what you just mentioned about using your PhD studies as well as your work as a managing editor to complement one another is a really special opportunity. And I'll also put another plug in for the journal. As you mentioned, the Journal of Sport for Development is open access. It's actually the first open access peer-reviewed journal dedicated to advancing sport for development and peace evidence. And since 2012, when it was founded, JSFD has published over 15 issues, over 90 peer-reviewed articles with hundreds of thousands of reads um, from over 175 countries. That was the count we did a few years ago. Hopefully that count's increasing because the journal is really dedicated to uh, hearing and showcasing voices from lots of different countries and doing it in a really developmental oriented way. So even if you're not highly experienced as a researcher, you can still submit a paper and receive feedback on it, even if the paper is not moving forward toward publication. So highly recommend anybody looks up the Journal of Sport for Development. And as Alessio and I also know, the team has frequent volunteer vacancies on typically an annual basis. So most of the editorial roles last about two or three years, depending on someone's schedule. So keep an eye on those opportunities and you could be the next managing editor with Alessio's help. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I, I also like wanted to, to highlight uh, uh, that everybody is a volunteer. So it is it is a very uh, uh, heartfelt effort, I would say, uh, when uh, when people put their time into the, the journal. And uh, I mean, a shout out really to everyone who, who puts their, their time into a journal uh, to, 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 to you know, have a busy schedule, but at the same time have that a uh, strong, uh, precise work that everybody does for the journal. I, I think it's incredible. And uh, yeah, but I, I just wanted to like thank everybody from the reviewers, from you know, like uh, the different editors, uh, uh, the, the copy, layout, web design. Uh, so it's very, very, very uh, a, a group effort, as we said before. And uh, it's one of the biggest examples of uh, group efforts in uh, sport for development. So Alessio, fast forward to five or 10 years from now, what do you hope to be doing or working on? Wow. Um, I hope uh, Palermo Football Club, my team, wins the Champions League. <laughs> That's my <laughs> first hope. I don't know. I, I feel that I want to continue the, the uh, academic career. I like to, to bring something that maybe has not been seen in research rather than uh, expanding on topics that may have been uh, already seen. So I hope that in the future I can uh, talk a bit wider on the role of sport in Sicily, for example, and like look look at what's close to me and keep doing research that is uh, that uh, i can put my heart on obviously the palermo thing that was true like i hope they win the Champions League. <laughs> <laughs> it's on your vision board understood understood yeah, exactly <laughs> Now that we know more about our guest's career journey, the rest of our conversation will allow us to have some fun and get to know our guest on a personal level through some rapid fire questions. We'll then start to wrap up with pointed questions focused on advice and how our listeners can transform interest into action. Enjoy the rest of the conversation. What words come to mind when I say Palermo FC? Best team in the world. <laughs> and I wrote that before I asked you the other questions. So you know what? I was ready. I was ready for your, your support there. <laughs> uh, best travel experience to date? The Great Wall in, uh, in China was a uh, most amazing experience ever. It feels un unreal. I, mean, I have no idea how this thing exists on Earth. It's amazing. What do you miss about China? 
I miss my friends that are still there and uh, the, the food, I would say I miss it a lot. My husband's from Shanghai. He asked me to ask, ask you which side of the river you lived on when you were in Shanghai. Kushi. So uh, she's west side. <laughs> I'll let him know. <laughs> <laughs> favorite sports memory? Um, favorite sports memory is when Palermo lost the final of the Italian Cup. Uh, and uh, uh, I was in Rome at 3 a.m. with my dad trying to find a taxi back home. It was an amazing, uh, <laughs> an amazing uh, night. In which city do you feel the most alive? In Palermo, I would say my hometown. Yeah, because there's a lot to do every time I go back. I have to drink a lot of coffees with friends and that makes me oh. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> when you complete your PhD, how are you going to celebrate? A holiday in uh, Maritimo, a small island uh, the, in the east of Sicily with only 200 inhabitants. So the people say when you finish the PhD, you need to relax. So I'm already envisioning the relax in there. So. <laughs> <laughs> Did I see that you worked for Chelsea FC and Barnett FC while studying in London? Yes, I worked as a receptionist in the hotel at uh, Stamford Bridge in Chelsea, and then in the pub of Barnet Football Club, both uh, part-time jobs. So so cool, so cool. <laughs> <laughs> what tips would you give to someone who's moving to a different country for the first time? Ooh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Be ready. Uh, don't take anything for uh, for granted. Uh, if you are moving it, uh, to a country that is close to you, uh, expect uh, some even some little differences and uh, be ready to listen more than talking at first, especially if the language is different. You may feel a bit excluded, but really you're listening to them be in the future uh, included. If you're going to a very uh, different country, which maybe has a different alphabet or like, a, uh, yeah, that, that very different uh, patterns, be uh, ready to be sociable because I think that you'll find people that help you from day one. You just need to be uh, ready to reach out to, to them. If anyone's considering a PhD in sport for development, what experiences do you recommend they seek before applying? Don't pursue a PhD, pursue a topic that you like and then do a PhD about it because otherwise you will not be motivated to finish. It's, it's much more than having a, a doctor at the start of a name. It's about passion and something that you have to put passion from three to five years think about your motivations and then if a phd is the best thing to explore it to do that good advice great advice <laughs> what academic programs short or long term do you recommend for folks interested in studying sport uh, i would definitely recommend both the one that we have here in, in loughborough as a master's um, and the one in Edinburgh that I attended, I can see from my personal experience, obviously I, I did attend a course uh, in Edinburgh, but at the same time, I frequently go uh, to the one in Loughborough where my uh, supervisor teaches. I would say that also not be afraid if you find something online that is an entry level into sport. I think it will give you a taster if you like a sport program or maybe you prefer something else. So mm -hmm. uh, a short course online, I think it's definitely valuable for that. What online resources would you recommend for individuals anywhere in the world who hope to learn more about sport for development? The journal of sport for development first. Um, if you don't um, uh, speak English, I would say use uh, a Google Translate function that can really help you translate it into your language and that would still work. And, and as well, Sport and Net is a great uh, uh, platform where you can learn a lot in a non-academic way. Um, and I would say that these are my, my top two, really. If you're looking for uh, something uh, very uh, accessible in Italian, uh, the, uh, that is related though to, to football and refugees, Specifically, uh, the Fiji uh, the Italian Federation, has a, a website for the a refugee teams project uh, with a lot of available resources in Italian. So 
that's something also to, to check out, in my opinion, that's very valuable. Nice, nice. Good to have an Italian option. And then for those English options, you mentioned jsfd.org and sportandev.org. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Tell us how can our audience support you or your work moving forward? Oh, well, I, I think that uh, uh, if you ever uh, come by something that, uh, uh, you know, I've uh, uh, written or spoken, obviously, you know, I read or something to know more about the context that would be uh, would be great. I think that there we have a lot to 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 learn from uh, from each other. And if you want to reach out to me, I'm always happy to you know have a, a, a discussion. I think that uh, there is a lot that we can do in uh, uh, as a team. And I'm I, I'm really happy uh, if my work is supported in uh, in in this way. And my final question that I ask all my amazing guests and that you gave me permission to ask you to answer in any language that you choose is who or what inspires you? Okay. Eh, I miei amici, la mia famiglia e tutte le persone che sono qui con me. Um, now I'll try the hard part. The hard part. Um, what a what a jaren, what a funny woman. Uh oh what a yeah, what a jaren, oh, what a funny woman. My my friends and my family, basically in English as well. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the Inspira Podcast with Erica Mueller Chen. I really hope you enjoyed the episode and found it useful. Be sure to check out the show notes for links and resources. Specifically, my link tree is there with tons of awesome information. Feel inspired to take action today? I've got three action steps you can take right now because you know your girl likes calls to action and the number three. So here goes. Number one, follow the podcast on your chosen podcast platform. Number two, share your feedback with me through the listener survey listed on that link tree. And number three, tell just one friend about this podcast so they can give it a listen to. And do I have any overachievers out there? I've got a bonus action step, which is to consider supporting me and making sure this passion project prospers. So number four, follow the link to buy me a coffee. That would be pretty amazing. Until next time, stay inspired. <laughs>